slowing down and probably net exports uh, are uh, peaked uh, and fixed capital investment is not going to be as productive as it had been in the past. And uh, therefore, the growth model is slowing down. And I don't I think that uh, demographics is destiny. And uh, if China's dem- demographics are, are not so great, uh, China's growth rate will not be so great. But uh, the quality of growth is much better uh, and more important than the quantity of growth. And so I expect that in 2022, China will add a trillion U.S. dollars uh, to GDP growth, global GDP growth, and that that'll be about 25 percent of global growth uh, probably for the year. So that's very, very uh, respectable. Uh, and something of great interest uh, to American companies. Thanks, Craig. And uh, uh, how do you think about this topic, Sean? Well, I, I agree with uh, Craig, uh, and, and many of the reasons for expected slower growth. Uh, uh, but there's a few other things. Number one, uh, the concern for st- sustainability is also a contributing factor. Because, you know, pollution in China, in many regions, so serious, you know. And then, and, and secondly, the income wealth inequality, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, is really a, a serious issue for China now. And then we have the Gini coefficient uh, higher than point four for the past two or three decades, you know. And then, then the governmental data is uh, says 0.465. But uh, according to many independent studies, that number could be much higher. And then, then that's the reason why China's spending more money on maintaining stability than national defense, you know. So uh, the stability budget is bigger than the defense budget of China. So uh, so the, the faster economic growth, definitely wider inequality, uh, at least uh, uh, for, for, for the past, you know. So from, from that point of view, I see the limit of uh, a neoliberalism model as, as uh, initiated by Misaccio in 1979, and, and followed so much by President Reagan in 1981. You know, uh, it, it did generate so much unprecedented economic growth and, and, and prosperity. But at the same time, uh, it did help generate so much inequality as well, income wealth-wise. So uh, China needs to slow down a little bit uh, uh, for the environmental concern, for income wealth inequality issue. So China will have more time and, and a space to, to, to address the issue of, uh, you know, now it's very uh, uh, the common in China, uh, the popular term, common prosperity, you know. So, uh, so those are new priorities for, for, for China. So the whole uh, uh, equations are, are very different now than, than, than in, in the past. Yes. So Thank great. Uh, great. Thanks, Xiang. And uh, what about you, Wen? Right. So obviously the slower growth in China, like uh, Sean said and Craig has said, is will allow China to uh, develop in a more sustainable way. It's just that like it's a larger base and it's still growing faster wow. than it's just it's still growing faster than than a lot of the other countries in, in, around the world or most of the other countries around the world. And I think that, um, you know, China is really focusing on internal growth versus uh, trying to depend on exports and external, you know, reliance on on goods and services from from abroad. They're trying to develop an internal uh, mechanism to help right. be self-sustainable. Exactly. So so I, I think, you know, like all of you reach a very, you know, like interesting um, consensus on this topic, which, you know, like the, the short term uh, slowing down in the growth is indeed for a better, you know, long-term profit. Um, and uh, because of, you know, like uh, different reasons involved. So let's go back to our topic. So, you know, we saw there are so many noises coming in uh, for the globalization recently, right? In the past few years, starting from the COVID, but COVID is not just uh, the case. There were COVID as well as the trade sanctions, as well as, you know, we saw what's really going on recently, you know, between Russia and Ukraine as well which, you know, there are so many noises affecting the globalization. But at the end of the day, you know, China and the U.S. are the largest economies in the world. And it's, you know, like what China and U.S. are doing is indeed going to affect uh, the world significantly. So if we go back to our topic, what's your thoughts on, you know, like the effects uh, towards, you know, like 
the world as well as you know China's future in general. You know, like uh, considering of the current situation in the world, such as the trade sanctions and uh, you know, like the the COVID and the, the different things going on in the world. So, Quark, do you want? To- sure. Sure. Yeah, let me say uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, uh, I think it's fair to say that the business relationships between China and the United States are, are actually pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. And from an economist uh, point of view, uh, the numbers uh, behind the U.S.-China trade uh, and investment relationship uh, look uh, good. Uh, so U.S. exports to China were up 11% in last year with agricultural exports up uh, as much as 35%. So 96% of our members uh, state uh, that their operations in China are profitable. And more than half of our members say that they're going to increase their investments uh, in uh, China. Um, So I think that Chinese companies continue to invest uh, in the United States and Chinese exports to the United States were terrific uh, last year. So from this perspective, uh, the overall uh, economic relationship between the two sides looks uh, quite healthy. But the reality, uh, I think, is much more uh, complicated, uh, especially when you take in the political uh, context uh, that business operates in. And the fact of the matter is that the uh, political relationship between the two sides is really icy cold, and there's virtually no cooperation uh, between uh, the two governments. The two governments, indeed, are are barely talking. So, um, and I I, I fear uh, that the two governments uh, both uh, look at this as either a zero-sum game, uh, and in some cases, a negative-sum game. Um, both governments are uh, actively uh, engaged in decoupling to reduce uh, dependencies uh, on on the the other, and at least in my view, uh, both governments are not really living up uh, to their commitments uh, under the the WTO, um, but commitments which they both freely, freely uh, took on. Um, just a couple of other uh, observations. Um, I, I guess if you asked why, um, that uh, the the reason would be probably internal politics uh, in in both countries, which is making it uh, more difficult uh, for Xi Jinping as he prepares for the twentieth Party Congress to compromise. And Joe Biden also is not in a position to compromise on many uh, trade things uh, for the midterm uh, election. So um, it's very difficult for business uh, now um, to expand. Um, It's difficult for new businesses to enter each other's markets uh, due to the tariffs. Um, And um, governments um, are not making it easier. And the degree of uncertainty is uh, really uh, quite, uh, quite high. And the uh, ability to predict the future is, is very minimal. So um, while businesses are doing quite well now, um, I do worry uh, about what the future may hold. Uh, And I'm hopeful that negotiations will get going, that we'll have some confidence building measures and that the overall bilateral relationship will settle down into a more constructive phase in the not distant future. Thank you. That's correct. That's a very interesting point you mentioned because, you know, from, you know, like the both governments are barely talk to each other, but uh, at the end of the day, the business are so associated with each other. Yep. Look at all the Global 500, which I know all those Global 500 are your members and they yep. are all doing business in China and there are yep. lots of, you know, Chinese companies doing business in the U.S. So it's a very interesting topic now. And so we have William just joined us. William, do you want to say hi and you know make a quick introduction to all of us? Yeah, sure. Apologies for being a little late. Uh, so uh, my name is William Balbean, um, a, uh, a VC investor early stage. Uh, so we help um, companies from around the world expand to Asia, uh, specifically China. Uh, we're also investing in Chinese companies and helping them go cross-border uh, outside of China. Uh, I'd say that uh, on the one hand, it's it's been quite difficult, especially uh last two years with COVID uh, to help companies go cross-border, the inability to travel uh, into China 
uh, and then the difficulty for traveling outside of China uh, ha has made that tough. Um, it's still happening, uh, but um, it's very difficult to uh, drive a business engagement uh, when you can't actually um, you know, see each other in person. Uh, so I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share here. Thanks. Great. Thanks, William. Um, so, uh, uh, Xiao, what's your view on you know, this topic? Well, uh, definitely uh, the China-U.S. relation is, is, is going the wrong direction from my point of view. <laughs> so no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, the positive side of this is the fact like China-U.S. trade uh, last year increased by 29%, you know, from Chinese statistics, you know. So the, the, the trade and investment mentioned by Craig uh, are going well, have been going well. So that's a positive sign. So that's a real, I mean, that could be a sign of re resilience of this investment and trade relations between the two nations. Because this is very important as a number one, number two economy globally. And then as, as, as you know, China has been contributing more to economic growth globally since 2008, you know. I hope this two economy continue to do well. U.S. has been doing well. And I think China will continue to do well. That's essential for the global economic recovery. And if the trade between the two nations has been going well, I think uh, that's a huge good news for global economy. I hope, uh, you know, the story will, will continue despite all the headwinds from the political, even geopolitical front, you know. And this is too important for this two key driver global economy to continue to be strong and, and engage with each other despite the effort of decoupling. <laughs> okay, so I, I remain uh, positive, uh, even hopeful, uh, this relation will be strengthened economically and trade-wise. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Xiang, because, you know, both of the economies and the internal, you know, like government situation is quite complicated itself. So it's a complicated story, but the business is ongoing. So thanks, Xiang, for that. And when I know you have business running uh, in, you know, the, the sports management sector and you have, you know, dealing with, you're dealing with, you know, manufacturing and international trades with China and the U.S. as well. So can you elaborate more on your thoughts on that? Sure, definitely. I, I do believe that like trade will help, uh, will help with the political situation. However, I do believe that like if, if there was a trade war, the U.S. would be on the losing side because China's focus is on the 1.4 billion citizens that they have and trying to manage that. And they're extending beyond just the United States trade. They're going with the Belt and Road Initiative into the Middle East and Africa and Europe. So they're trying to <clears throat> de-emphasize their, their connection with the United States. Now, with that in mind, you know, they're trying to in increase the 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 economic uh, engines in the in the interior. So that means that like a lot of the migrant workers uh, that traditionally have gone to the coast to work are now staying at home. I mean, back in 2019, there was about 300 million migrant workers that would travel to the Eastern seaboard to, to work. Now with COVID, that actually has helped them or helped China because a lot of them decided not to go back to the Eastern seaboard. So our factories right now are having a hard time, really hard time fighting fighting workers, and as it, it reduces the the growth of the of the larger cities on the eastern seaboard. <clears throat> but in the meantime, it a lot of the growth is going to be in the interior 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 cities like Xi'an and Chongqing and all these other cities that are on the on the western side of China. <clears throat> and so, I think that like you know. It's it's about not really focusing on the like Craig said is zero sum game. It's more about seeing what the lens of China, what they're dealing with. They they still want to have a communistic overlay on everything, where everybody is relatively equal. I mean, granted, you know, Jack Ma and everybody, all these Chinese business ty tycoons are much more wealthy than the than the poorer segment of the population, but 800 million Chinese people were lifted out of poverty from 1979 to, to now. That's, that's more than any, any other country in the history of the world to lift them out of poverty. So 
China wants to bring that balance back, right? To try to make sure that、uh, people are wealthy but not wealthy, and people are, who are poor are not that poor. So I think that、um, with the trade sanctions is only going to hurt the United States versus China, who is really focused on internal development and growing the self reliance that they've been working on for decades. Thanks, Wayne. That's very thoughtful, you know, insights from you know the you know business and、uh, you know the international trade perspective. And、uh, William, I know you know your company has been playing around with Chinese market for a long time, and、uh, you know yourself both staying, spending some time in the U.S. as well as you know Beijing as well.、Uh, so, how how do you think? About this topic, from you know your、uh, what you guys are doing right now, because you know your company is actually focusing on helping companies, investing companies who like to expand internationally, and you you guys have a investment strategy implement for China. So how's the you know current situation affecting your company as well as what, what what's the future for your industry? How do you think on that? Sure, I think sure. one of the biggest changes recently、uh, has been the kind of a crackdown on big internet. So,、um, you know, you've got、uh, Europe and finding companies like Google、um, push back in the U.S. against Facebook and Google,、uh, and uh, in China、uh, things move a lot quicker usually.、Uh, so, there's a massive crackdown on big internet.、Uh, this is driving、uh, what we see as an increase in competition. Um, and、uh, this has been, I think, a big positive. Not quite sure how positive it will be,、uh, but、uh, we think it's a big positive. So we actually reduced our exposure、uh, to China、um, quite significantly, starting about four years ago, especially on the consumer side,、uh, because the lack of competition made it very difficult for early stage smaller companies to compete.、Um, we are increasing our exposure a bit. Uh, now,、um, but it's mostly Chinese、uh, tech-driven startups、uh, whose applications can、uh, be very useful outside of China. So helping them sell abroad. And then the interesting thing is we're helping global startups come into China, and we don't initially sell to Chinese、uh, customers. We actually sell to multinationals in China、uh, because those multinationals, you know, I think six. I, I read somewhere sixty percent of the top companies around the world think that China will be its, their number one revenue market. Uh, in the coming years,、um, but they're they're facing a huge amount of competition、uh, from、uh, local players,、uh, so they're really on the back foot. Back they don't, foot. Have, they the, don't the, have the the you know the tax、uh, credits or tax breaks and and, and、uh, that they used to.、Uh, so it's a, it's quite difficult for them.、Um, the last thing I, I would just say is we're we're investing、uh, globally in in aging tech or silver tech,、um, and we think that's a huge opportunity、uh, in China and across Asia. Uh, bringing technology from around the world into China around aging tech、um, numbers, I've seen is the you know the the China labor force is going to get cut in half、uh, anywhere between twenty and forty years from now, uh, and uh, uh, making it it's going to have to drive a extreme transition in the economy,、uh, and there's just going to be a huge number of people that need to be cared for, and they're not going to be able to be cared for by、uh, you know by、uh, physical means.、Uh, technology is going to have to play a role.、Uh, so we think this is a You know,、yeah. an opportunity. Thanks. Thanks, William. That's very interesting points because my my company is doing similar things, but we focus on you know like a different side of the sectors, and、uh, we did see you know similar to you, we did see a shift in the sector focus as well for certain sectors. You know, it's it's going to be difficult, more much more difficult in China. Certain sectors is going to be uprising. So so let's go back to let's give the Mac back to Craig. So Craig, I have a few questions for you. So how how do you envision? Because you know you're more standing on the diploma side. So how do you envision the business relationships between U.S. companies and the Chinese market and Chinese companies, of course, in the near term and the long term? So it's a complicated question, and、uh, I think it's、uh, important probably to break down、uh, industry by industry. Um, certainly,、uh, in consumer goods,、uh, it's a hundred percent full speed ahead. Uh, uh, very much, as Wayne had noted,、uh, very much wanting to work with、uh, the emerging Chinese middle class. In energy, I would say it's full speed ahead、uh, because the U.S. has a lot of、uh, um, hydrocarbons, and we're happy to sell them. Um, albeit um,、uh, right now at very high prices,、um, 
I think uh, in ag, in food, it's also full speed ahead. Uh, that uh, that's um, uh, the the U.S. is going to be a major supplier of soybeans, corn, wheat, meat, uh, fish, etc., uh, for in perpetuity uh, uh, around the world. One third of our soy, soybean crop is sold around the world. When you get to industrials, I, I, I think that um, uh, William and Wayne uh, touched on that uh, nicely. Uh, and it's very competitive, uh, but American companies need to be there. China is 20% of the world's population uh, and uh, probably a third of it, the world's growth. And American companies are going to compete uh, and be successful in that market. And if they're not, they're not going to be global leaders. Uh, uh, an American company must be a leader in China if they are to be a global leader. I think uh, life sciences is complex, uh, but uh, and difficult, uh, competitive, uh, and and high tech. Uh, but that's uh, an area right now that there's quite a bit of uh, tension. Um, and tech is another area, and aerospace. A lot of uh, 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 political uh, export control, technology uh, control uh, problems. Uh, and so it's a big mix, uh, depending on what sector you're in. Um, uh, uh, but but generally, uh, I'd say that the 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 place where government regulation is is most difficult is uh, tech, uh, aerospace, uh, telecom. Um, uh, and let's hope uh, that government regulation doesn't crowd out. Uh, collaboration uh, in life sciences. I, I, I think that that's possible. I worry about that um, and hope uh, that uh, governments uh, will allow businesses to do what businesses do, and that is uh, to take advantage of their comparative uh, advantage uh, and create prosperity. Uh, but we shouldn't assume uh, that, and we need to fight hard uh, to ensure that there's a level playing field and that governments um, don't um, uh, try to restrict uh, what is normal trade around the world. And I think that there are some negative signs, both in Beijing and in Washington, on that front. Thanks, Craig. That's, you know, like, that's a very good point, because, you know, originally I'm about to ask you what are the similarities for U.S. and China in the business contact and what are the things, you know, most countries could do or collaborate together to better manage the chaos and challenges in the business world. But I'm going to add on one more question to these, because, you know, what could go wrong if, you know, like both countries do collapse on all those different sectors you mentioned? What could go wrong for the world? Well, um, you, you know, I, I don't think that we need to look at worst case scenarios. There's uh, other people who are, can do that. Uh, uh, that's not my job. Uh, but what I would say that uh, to the extent that businesses are forced into uh, regulatory or other uh, restrictions uh, mm -hmm. that impede growth, that it leads to lower competitiveness, lower total factor productivity, lower growth, uh, and lower opportunity uh, for everyone. Uh, and if China does poorly, America will do poorly. If America does poorly, then China will do poorly. This is a positive sum game uh, um, and one that we, we really need to uh, do a better job to emphasize the benefits for both American citizens and, and for Chinese citizens. Uh, this is an era of populism, it's an era of ideology, it's an era of nationalism, and all of those are not friendly uh, to growth. Uh, a former boss of mine said, capital is a coward. Uh, it doesn't go where it's not welcome. And is Chinese capital welcome in the United States now? I hope so. Is American capital welcome in China? I hope so, but we must not take that for granted. Thank you. That's Craig. Uh, so, so Sean, I'll move the mic to you. So, how do you think? I know you know you're you're the founding dean of the business school, and uh, you know you got lots of students from all different backgrounds in the business world and the political world. So, how do you think the policy shifting is affecting global globalization in China, and what's a better approach in terms of the economic growth, you know, for both China and the global economy? Uh, I I think. You know, uh, the reason uh, China did well, at least the key reason, and also uh, the global economy did well is because of uh, this uh, neoliberalism and of uh, globalization. 
So trade investment, cross-border, are essential and beneficial to all of us, you know. So this, the, we don't need to argue about that. But a fundamental issue for me is there could be uh, too much capitalism in China and the United States, and then there may be too much socialism in Europe. So to me, that's a fundamental imbalance. Uh, I mean, I've been spending much time in Europe now. I see the socialism. My God, you know, you go to Scandinavian countries, you know, education covered by government, you know, and then, then, then the healthcare system covered the whole thing. You know, like, uh, uh, so uh, so that I think uh, we're, I mean, China, United States, uh, in that regard, uh, the two countries which have embraced more liberalism better than any other economist, really putting too much pressure on country like Europe. Like Europe, they did well. You know, they they're only to sustain a competition from the United States. Now they have a new competition from China. So I have a lot of sympathy, empathy for European uh, system. Uh, you know, we're not born to be an entrepreneur. Uh, we're not born to be a great uh, innovator. This are fine. You know, we need a uh, uh, talent people like that. But at the same time, that's not a purpose of life. By the way, you know. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, I, I hope uh, you know this. Uh, after 2008, the global uh, changes of disruptions uh, are, are, are sort of uh, uh, helping uh, this, mitigating this imbalance. Uh, and, and, and in particular, the common prosperity drive in China. Because in China, uh, when I look at the first time, look at the Gini coefficient, it was second highest right after Brazil. Uh, 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 this is 2008, you know. China has that problem for a long, long time. And China, also under investing in social security front if you compare china with european countries especially eu countries you know if you benchmark against china china against that of russia and brazil again china fall far behind in healthcare education you just name it okay so china had a serious problem the first level of distribution wealth china has been under investing in social security program you know, despite the fact, you know, we, we, we name ourselves as socialistic countries, you know. And at the third level of distribution wealth, like, you know, this NGOs, philanthropy giving U.S. as far ahead of anyone in that regard, you know. China, again, you know, we give less than 0.1% of our GDP. U.S., the most generous nation on earth, giving 2.1% of their GDP, you know. So uh, so you look at level two, level three distribution wealth, uh, China fall far behind each every front. So now you understand the reason why, from Chinese government point of view, they may not be concerned about uh, how healthy a tree is. They, they, they worry about a whole forest, you know. So for the future, any major company, whether high tech or not, if you don't define your social purpose clearly and convincingly to the Chinese government and the Chinese society, uh, you, you you could have a problem. You could have a problem, you know. And in the Chinese system, we change things fast, you know. And, and, and not like the U.S., you have a two decades long antitrust argument between government and some of the tech companies, you know. So the, this is going to be new, 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 new ecosystem for China. And, and, and that's going to be the case for, for some time, for 10 or 20 years to come, you know. Uh, and and secondly, yeah, I think you need you need to be confident, positive about the future of China trade because China is the largest trading partner for about hundred thirty some economies, you know, and and then the largest single largest trading nation, you know, and then and 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 and, and then most of Chinese manufacturing products are what I call non mainstream sectors: ties, lighters, sewing machines, socks. There are no, no national security issues with, with, with those kind of products. So uh, the export from China, uh, you know, in telecom, uh, aerospace are relatively minor. So, so it's okay. So the political, uh, the geopolitical risk will not do so much damage. Uh, I hope, I hope, because the structure of the, uh, of the export. Yeah. Thank you. That's Dan Xiao. So, uh, you know, we, we need some, you know, like more and more, uh, uh, there are people, you know, originally from U.S. and originally from Europe in China, in Beijing, and there are people, you know, originally from China in different, you know, places in the U.S. as well. And the interesting scenario that, uh, you know, both of them figured is, you know, there are more and more uh, socialism appeared 
in countries such as U.S. and you know, like、uh, countries such as Finland, some places in Europe, and there are more and more, you know, similar things like such as the capitalism. You know, actually, it's you know, like happens in Beijing and the rest of China. So it's quite interesting about、uh, how those two, you know, like culture,、uh, you know, merging together. So,、uh, so, so, when I have a question for you. So, as an industry expert, what are the suggestions you have for the policymakers to advance the current context? Well, I, I think that the policymakers in China they're doing whatever they're doing in order to drive the changes within the the, the country itself, and they're trying to protect the 1.4 billion people. Now, international policymakers who have to deal with China have to make a decision in terms of. Whether they want to engage with China and slow that progress down in terms of, you know, making sure that they have some influence or some say in how China manages its internal social and political and economic policies, or it can, it can, it can、uh, kind of become more distant from from China and then allow China to、uh, accelerate its. It's hegemony against you know the Middle East and Africa and Europe. So, it, I think it really depends on how you want the policymakers to how how they want to manage China. You, you can't you cannot disengage and think that it's going to hurt them. In fact, you have to the policymakers have to engage even more in order to find some. Uh, triggers for influence in order to make sure that there is some、um, changes that would be aligned towards what Europe would like or the U.S.、Um, yeah, and and I think that in some ways, you know, Sean mentioned that the these statistics about where China is, I, I think people forget that like China is still a third world country. I mean, its its GDP is or its economy is the First and second largest, but spread among 1.4 billion people. I mean, if you look at Europe, it's only 400 million. I mean, the United States is about 350 million people. So, like, you know, if you take those economies and spread it out as a per capita, it's it's really really low. So,、uh, I think that in some ways, socialism is kind of the next step after capitalism, right? Like, once you have a secure foundation for everybody, then you can start thinking about.、Um, The higher hierarchy of needs, and then the higher、um, call it, wishes of the, of the of the social aspects. Whereas China, right now, even though they consider themselves communism, they haven't really gotten to the point where everybody is at a point where they can live a relatively、um, prosperous life. Right? They're still struggling with health care issues or poverty and. And political issues and religious issues and stuff like that, but ultimately, in the end, once they can bring that to a standard or or a higher level, then they can start thinking about, you know,、um, other things other than like the the well being of people. Thanks, William. Very good point. And、uh, William, so it's now. So I know you're. you're Your company is dealing with, you know, lots of、uh, startups as well as technology companies. So, how do you think、uh, the impact of a lower growth for China and Western companies doing business here, as well as, you know, like it's now the right time for, you know, more and more Western companies and U.S. investors to start exploring the Chinese market, and why is that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think...、Uh... You know, China is a very, very big market. So even though the growth is、uh, smaller, there's still quite a lot of opportunity there.、Uh, I think the the challenge is,、um, you know, what does a international investor or even an international company have that、uh, enables them to be competitive in China versus a local player, right? Because、uh, local players understand the market. There's plenty of capital in China,、uh, and uh, the um, traditional. Sort of tax rates and benefits that foreign investors used to have are, are really no longer there.、Uh, and then to put the cherry on top of the cake. I mean,、um, just the inability to travel into China、uh, to get visas.、Um, I mean, we have three team members outside, and we wanted to bring them back inside, but it's been a, it's been a couple of years. It's it's nigh on impossible to get into the country.、Uh, so that just makes、uh, business very difficult. 
uh, when you can't uh, do a face-to-face meeting, you can't go uh, and visit people, uh, visit folks. Um, so, um, I mean, I did two quarantine. I have a visa because I was in China when the ca- visas were canceled uh, and the borders were shut. And then I went out and I came back in. Um, um, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, uh, to to do uh, cross border investment without visiting. I mean, we've had we've seen deals just fall apart uh, because um, of that inability to uh, to to visit. Uh, for example, you know, if there's something going wrong, um, how do you step in and help, right? Um, and, and so hopefully this loosens up uh, sometime soon. Um, I mean, right now we're on a 21 day quarantine, and that's a quite a long time to spend in a in a room by yourself. Yes. Uh, so hopefully things uh, open up. Exactly. I mean, everyone needs to calculate the economics. So not just the, you know, the, not really the flight tickets, but really, you know, the time for the quarantine, right? Like three weeks yeah, in China yeah. for the quarantine, and then uh, you might get another few weeks quarantine if you arrive certain countries in Europe. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Right. The, the other yeah. challenge right now is that there are simply no flights. So yes. most right. people in the U.S. I saw a couple of them. They're supposed to be going back. Uh, but uh, but uh, they, there's no flights until I think uh, mid April at April, and we'll see what happens. Right. Let, let's see how the policy is shifting. You know, later this uh, later this year, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, we try and drive engagement, but it's a little hard to engage if you can't see each other. It's difficult. <laughs> I understood. <laughs> and and right, right now, the interesting scenario is people are getting used to uh, working remotely. <laughs> Don't really want to go back to the office that often. You are in the U.S., right? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been in the office, back in the office in Shanghai since March 2020. Uh, so it's a very different experience than the rest of the world's had. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, in terms of COVID and the management of it, it's been very strong. It's been very good. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really help for uh, cross-border engagement, cross-border trade, and, and, and cross-border relations. Uh, if, uh, you know, like, uh, I'll give you some examples. I mean, don't quote me on these numbers because... Uh, but I think you know Shanghai is down to maybe about 160,000 foreigners, uh, and I think it when previously it was somewhere north of 500,000, and there were a lot of people kind of uh, going in and out on visitors visas, doing visa runs to Hong Kong. Um, so I heard numbers uh, closer to a million at some points, uh, and then uh, Beijing is uh, even lower because uh, of the restrictions. I think it's uh, down to like 120,000 or 20. You know, it's it's uh, a lot smaller than it used to be. Exactly, exactly. Thanks, William, for sure, right? So uh, I saw we only have a few minutes left, and uh, I know it's all late for you know all of us. So you know I don't want to track all of you here for a long time, <laughs> you know Friday night or you know like midnight in, on Saturday. So uh, w- w- let me just finish this by uh, so so can each of you share you know the key takeaways for today, Craig? Sure. Um, So I think that the bilateral relationship is uh, complex and becoming more complex. Um, COVID uh, is a real impediment. And I have to tell you, I'm worried about Hong Kong uh, very much uh, and hopeful that that doesn't uh, 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 move into um, uh, on the mainland. But um, I've been uh, working on U.S.-China relations for 40 years. And I can tell you, it's always been impossible. Uh, It's never going to be easy. It's never been easy, but we always find a way to manage it. Uh, We always find a way uh, to make uh, the impossible happen uh, and grow and change and adapt and and shift uh, so that our businesses are able to continue and to grow. And so while uh, there are uh, a million challenges uh, in 2022, uh, it's always been that way. Um, And uh, we'll get out of this as well, Uh, at least those who manage their businesses well uh, and uh, 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 remain uh, fully in compliance with all laws uh, and uh, work with integrity. And uh, I have no doubt. Uh, that those who do uh, will prosper despite all the many challenges. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. And Dian Xiang? Well, it's number one, number two, economy global in GDP, and also number one, number two in trade. China's number one, U.S. number two, and also number one, number two contributor to global economic growth. 
I think this is essential for the future global economy. And and, and I still remain uh, positive, at least hopeful, things will work out for China, United States, and globally. And for China, you know, like uh, I, I'm, I will be doing a talk for Katia in Dubai. And then, then for many of the luxury brands, uh, Chinese market always contributing 50% or even 70% of the global business, you know. I mean, they, 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 they have to do well in China in order to survive. I think that's the case for many, many global economy. And China will continue to be a key driver of a global trade. And, and, and I hope investment as well. Uh, with, uh, with the, the RCEP, uh, you know, went into force January 1st. That's a very positive sign in today's uh, in- environment. And thirdly, I think it's about time to ch- for China to contribute globally, which goes way beyond trade investment. And that's the reason why I'm in Europe. I want to set up more unicorn companies in Europe because U.S., China are doing well. Europe fall far behind. Not a single unicorn company in Italy. Number eight economy globally, you know. So, uh, you know, William is here. I think maybe the possibility of uh, uh, working together because uh, China has been, in my definition, by far the most disruptive economy globally for, for the past two decades. Let's export, share our experience with our European friends and, and economies. We help them to grow better in that regard. Thank you. Thanks, Dian Xia. It's always good to measure numbers so you know everyone know exactly what's going on. So, Wen, what's your key takeaways for today's meeting? Well, I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm assured by all these experts that um, you know the world is not going to implode and we're not going to have a nuclear war with Russia and China and the United States are going to continue to work together and build a better future together. I, uh, that's one of the big things that like. I've been worried about over the last, you know, two years, especially uh, with the end of Trump and then the beginning of Biden. And I thought that it would have been better, but it's not. And then, and then with COVID, and then now with Russia, and then whether China is backing Russia or not, it's 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 a lot of uncertainty. But I think all of us kind of agree that like it's it, the the world's been there and done that, and it survived, and we can move forward and basically, um, we'll be okay. So that's my key takeaway, which helps me sleep at night now. That's, really, that's, that's real thoughts from, you know, like from an industry player, right? That's your, you know, like delegate the real thoughts from the industry players. Uh, very, you know, very helpful thoughts. And uh, William, what's your final takeaways? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm very much focused on uh, business as opposed to politics. Uh, and uh, in order to drive, um, you know, what we what we do is which is cross border, helping companies go cross border. Um, you know, stability is key, uh, and uh, so stability in terms of the ability to ship, you know, stability in terms of regulation, uh, and uh, stability uh, in terms of um, you know, hopefully, uh, communication channels and actual travel channels. Um, so I uh, just hope that things uh, continue uh, on a, uh, a stable track uh, and uh, and that we can actually keep these ties uh, strong um, because that's really what uh, helps keep stability uh, is uh, coming together as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, shifting apart. Um, now, things have been moving apart, you know, pretty rapidly for the last few years. Uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, slow that down and may- maybe reverse that. Great. So thanks, William, for the final comments on that. And, uh, you know, thanks, for, uh, thanks everyone for joining the meeting today and taking the time. And uh, we just uh, finished on time, which is perfect. And, uh, you know, hope everyone, you know, like uh, have a great weekend and enjoy your night. Thank you. Thank all yeah, of thank you. Thank you all. You're thank you, Shibrite. Bye. 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 Thanks.